Amen, amen. We thank you, Father, that we can come in joyful expectation this morning, knowing that you are a good God. We thank you that we can turn our eyes to you, Jesus. We set our eyes on the things of the Spirit this morning. Thank you, Father, that we can set our eyes on the things of the Spirit, and this world can become strangely dim when we set our eyes on our Father. And he brings peace to our souls. So we set our eyes this morning. We praise you, Jesus. This is all about you, Jesus. We lift up your name. We thank you for the sacrifice that you gave, that you gave your life for us, that you had us in mind on that cross. And you said, I will give my life so that you can be reconciled to the Father. So we lift you up, Jesus. We thank you that you are the hope of this world. You are the hope of our future. You're the hope for our family. You're the hope for our relationships. You're the hope for our communities. You're the hope for this nation in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen, amen. amen. You may be seated on your way down, turn to your neighbor and says, you're looking sharp this morning. I don't know where you got that outfit, but man, you're looking good. I mean, you look good, you feel good, isn't it? Come on. Uh, well, welcome this morning. It's good to have everybody in the building, uh, getting more and more people into the building, which is a blessing. More and more people get coming together, experiencing not just the awesome presence of God, but in community. It's, we were made for community, so it's so good to be together and, um, and be having some nice fellowship after the service and before. And um, those joining us online, we're also excited to have you with us. Um, we also want to start off by welcoming anybody that's here for the first time. So if it's your first Victory Church service, we'd love to give you a free coffee and a high five. Um, so if that's you, don't you just want to raise your hands so that we can welcome you. Is it your first service? Here we go. We've got somebody right in the front here, somebody over that side at the back. Let's welcome them. We're stoked to have you here this morning. Um, we're going to get a card to you now. If you can fill in that card, and then after the service, don't run away. Um, through the back over there is our visitor's lounge. That's where all the good coffee's hidden. Um, just joking. Uh, but we want to meet you after the service. So bring the card back to the back there. Meet some of our pastoral staff um, and get plugged in and get connected um, and get free coffee. Come on, that's a good deal. Um, and then those of you joining us online and it's your first time joining us, hit the new here tab. Um, and then you can fill in your info there and then we'll see how we can serve you as a church wherever you may be around the world or even in South Africa. Um, but yeah, that's me for this morning. I'm going to hand over to Chad um, as he encourages us in the area of giving this morning. Thanks, Billy. Good morning, church. Good morning, family. I'd like to encourage us in our giving this morning. I trust that you're all excited to sow into the kingdom today. Um, I'd like to share from Genesis 8:22. It says this, While the earth remains, seed time and harvest time shall not cease. I'm just going to read that again. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest time shall not cease. So God's speaking to Noah after the flood and he's making these promises. And um, he basically says, as long as the earth is, is in existence, there will always be seed time and there will always be harvest time. We know that God provides the seed. Throughout our lives, we'll be continuously in this process. Um, of planting seeds in order to reap a harvest in the future. What that harvest will look like, however, is determined by our attitude and how we give. And we determine the outcome of our harvest by our attitude. In another scripture in Galatians 6 verse 9, it says, Let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. So the seeds we sow now determine our future. They are a bridge into our future. And the attitude we have towards the seeds we sow determines the outworking of our future. So I'd like to encourage us today as we sow our seed into God's kingdom. If we give with a positive, faithful attitude, then our harvest will be good. Um, and it will change our future and those around us. So let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you that seed time and harvest time is your perfect process, Father. And we pray today as, you, as we so into your kingdom father that the harvest will be great lord we just we pray for signs wonders and miracles lord we pray for lives to be changed in this town in this area in our nation father so yeah we just pray today lord as we come with faith faithful hearts father and we sow into your kingdom and we know that your harvest will be great lord we pray this in jesus name just a reminder of ways to give um, the offering baskets will go around you can also give on our website uh, all our details are there and on our app and on your screens now, you can scan the Zappa code. So let's just turn out uh, to the church insight um, as we enjoy this week's news. Hi 
and welcome to Victory Church and Church News. Yeah. This is where we want to update you with the life of Victory Church. Yeah, that's awesome. So it's lockdown level one. How amazing Woo! is that? <laughs> it's so awesome to be able to celebrate that. But with that, we still want to ask, please adhere to social distancing mm. regulations. Keep that mask on, uh, social distance. You know, mm. when, you, when you greet people, do the elbow, do Come the on. Bluetooth high five. Um, Most powerful. Come on, that was good. <laughs> and if you've got a coffee or a tea from a machine, that's amazing. Uh, we just keep that mask on, pull it down, have a quick sip, put it back up. And for worship and all of those things, we keep the mask yep. up. And that's how we get to be considerate of one another. And another part of the restrictions that have been lifted and that there's an increased capacity means that you don't have to register for the services on Sunday mornings That's anymore. Awesome. Yeah. And although that facilitated a process for us in the past, we're just able to have you come. You can rock up with great excitement and ready to engage with us. Yeah. And the only thing you have to do is when you come here is you just sign your name and your number and how many people that's in your family that's joining you in that morning and then you can come in and enjoy the service with us. Isn't that fantastic? It's amazing to see what God is doing with the kids ministry and, and that team. And, uh, and part of that team, they've actually developed an incredible resource for parents, teachers, and anyone that works with kids that facilitates um, the freedom that kids get to walk into, especially focusing on identity in Christ. And this course is called Unlocking Freedom for Kids. And uh, you can go check it out on our amazing Come training on. hub Come by on. going to victorychurch.org forward slash training hub. No? You just go to the Victory Church website. There's a <laughs> button that says training hub. You can just click on that. It's the easiest way to do it. So the Victory Church website. Yeah. Click on training hub. You can sign up for a free account. There are multiple courses on there, but go check out the new course. Go find the right course for you. We can't help. Uh, yeah, we can't wait to see you being equipped as the saints for the work of the ministry. Come on. Wow, isn't that awesome? You know, having resources available for the whole church to, to, to use, it's really no, just such a blessing. And then um, if you are not yet in a connect group, you know, it is something that is so integral to the life of Victory Church. It's one of the places where you know, we really just experience life and we get together in small groups and we have fun and we pray for one another and worship together. It's, it's really awesome. So if you're not yet in a connect group and you'd like to sign up for one, it's really easy. You can do it online or in the building. Uh, so if you're online, you can click the join a group button on Church Online, oh. uh, hit the link in the YouTube or Facebook descriptions. But if you are in the building, you can just go to the Info Hub and sign up there. And then one of the other events coming up is our new members course. And if you are, you know, maybe you've been here for quite some time, but you want to find out more about the heart of your church and where you can get involved and uh, yeah, more about what we are about, the vision and the mission and our values, this is the place you want to be. Maybe you are just new yet this morning and you want more info. Where you want to be is on the 24th and the 31st of October. We're doing our new members course. And for more information, uh, you can either go to the Info Hub and sign up there. Or if you are on Church Online, you can just scan the, the QR code on your screen right now. That's awesome. And then lastly, it's been a long one, but lastly, keep keep focusing. Uh, we've got the VGY auction coming up on the 29th of October at 7 p.m. Mm -hmm. Save the date for that. It is one of the highlights of the Victory calendar every year. Uh, it's a lot of fun. We're gonna have live music. Absolutely. We're gonna have you know, just a lot of laughs and uh, it's, always a, it's always a big one. So remember the 29th of October, 7 p.m. Um, keep an eye out for more details. And that's it from us. Have a fantastic service. We can't wait to see you next week for Church News. Cheers. Jesus Christ, I live in
sing that this morning with faith in our hearts. Then came the morning. Then came the morning.
Jesus, Jesus, holy and anointed, Jesus, sing Jesus, Jesus.
thank you this morning for your presence in the house. We thank you that you're with us and amongst us and we honor you this morning. Thank you for, for your presence. I just want us to stand like this for a moment just in the presence of God. Just receive his presence. Just allow him to speak to you and minister to you sensing God so strongly in our midst, uh, sense His presence and His goodness and His kindness amongst us so strongly. Um, I'm hearing Him speaking to people. Mm, thank you, Father.
Benji and Mona, I just heard that the Lord spoke to me this morning, just even before you just walked up to me and he said to me, I'm breaking all striving and tension. And there's a breakthrough coming that you have not bargained for because there's a desire in your heart just to go to new places in God and Satan has tried to interfere with the process and cause confusion and God said, but I'm breaking that thing this morning over you and bringing you into a wide open space with me that will surprise you and you can just, as of today, rest because he's going to do what you can't do for yourself because he's a good father. Adam, Adam, God says, welcome home, son. You're my son. Welcome home, son. You're my son. Welcome home, son. Welcome home, son. You're my son. Kurt, where are you? Wave at me. Where's Kurt? Kurt, I feel God says um, there's a desire in your heart over you for your family and for... Um, you and Megan, you're dreaming a dream, and God says, you know, He's releasing upon you a new insight and a, and a new understanding. I, I know that you, you've got a company called Blue Noise, and, uh, and you've had some success. God's blessed you, but God says, I'm raising up a new name that's above all names as a standard in your heart and in your family and in your marriage and in your business because I've seen your desire to go to new places with me. And so just, um, just in the days to come, there's new revelation and insight and understanding. There's things that you are desiring in your heart that you struggle to articulate. And God says, I'm going to bring clarity and revelation that's going to just blow your mind. Because that's what revelation is. It's beyond your mind and your understanding. Uh, Ria, I feel God says to me this morning that He's redirecting your plans for your life. Um, I know a little bit about you, not too much, but God says, I'm redirecting your whole life. Um, there's always been a desire to please God, to obey God, to, to do things for God. And, and I know you told me a while ago that you've gone through a difficult patch and it's impacted your life because you've seen the goodness of God. And God says, not just have you seen my salvation and my deliverance, but I'm gonna set you up for what I've really called you for. And God says, I'm redirecting your path so be ready in these days for a fresh impartation and a, and a new direction concerning the king and the kingdom. All right? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. I want to preach the word that we're going to minister to some more people this morning. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your goodness and your kindness. Pray that you'll minister to us this morning in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Hallelujah. It's wonderful to have you here this morning. It's always wonderful to be in person thank you wherever you're joining us from online it's good to have you with us um, we're going to continue to worship I, I don't want to be too long this morning I feel God wants to minister to people uh, and touch some hearts and lives this morning um, I had somebody that's that phoned me this week and um, shared with me a vision or a dream that they've had uh, and it was for somebody particular but as, as I thought about it and um, meditated on it, I felt God spoke to me and said to me, just declare it over the congregation. The dream was somebody, um, it, was, it was somewhere on a farm and, uh, and there was a, a lot of fresh water, a fresh water tank, but, but there was no use of the water and the fresh water because there was around this tank that need to release all the fresh water, two massive pythons. Uh, and restricting and stopping the flow of the water and, uh, and how God came and He just broke the restriction and the hold of the enemy in and around that fresh water. And I want to declare over you this morning, if ever you experience some form of restriction of the very life and the water of God, I break that over you today in Jesus' name. Whatever it is, wherever you find yourself, it's not just a word for somebody, it's a word for us. It's the day and the time where God's going to release His water to flow afresh, not just into you, but through you. Remember, we started a few weeks ago with a series on fresh oil, and I can't go back to everything and repeat everything, but I want to just highlight, God says, I want to pour fresh oil upon you. 
Amen? We can't be Christians. We can't be people of God and live uh, with a restriction and limitations and oppression and depression and, uh, and not have a, a faith level and a confidence about our God and who He is to us and through us. The Holy Spirit in you is for you. The Holy Spirit on you is for others. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Okay. Now, before I preach, I just want to make a quick announcement. We've had uh, a few attempts, and they didn't work out too well. Um, next weekend, uh, there's a short mini-conference at GLA called The World Needs a Father. Uh, Cassie Carstens, not Casey, as has been said before. Uh, hallelujah. You know, I have learned over the years, you have to take it as it comes. I remember ministering in Switzerland many years ago for a whole two or three weeks on end every night. And the pastor that introduced me kept on introducing me as Lionel. I couldn't get in his head. My name is Louis Els. I just accepted the new name, Lionel. That's my stage name. So uh, he at least welcomed me and he made the announcement. So I want to say to you, Cassie is a dynamic man of God. He's a, he's a father uh, in the kingdom of God, wrote a beautiful book on the world needs a father and uh, has got a heart and a passion to see men rise and fathers come forth to fulfill their roles in the kingdom, in families, in the workspace and place, and make a difference. I don't want to get too deep into this, but we know so often people are struggling with bondages, brokenness, and issues in their lives because they've got a wrong image of their heavenly father due to what happened with an earthly father. And, and let me say this to you before I preach. I don't care how great, and I say that carefully, not arrogantly. I don't care how good a father you've been, you don't match to God. I had to discover that some other time. As much as I tried to be the best father, I missed it because God says, call no one father except me. And so at the best of the efforts that we put in, we come short so that people could fall in love with a God that will never leave nor forsake you, that comfort you and, and care for you and encourage you and draw the best out of you. And so uh, we're going with a contingent of men. There's a lot, a lot that, that have already gave me a big yes that they're going next Friday. It's going to be Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. So, uh, you know, I, I said to somebody the other day, uh, I'm not going to try to promote this. I'm going to trust that you're going to hear God with me because I believe a, a big of, a lot of emphasis that we're going to do next year is put uh, as focus on family and fathering. Amen? And so I'm calling on the men, and the men said, yay, yeah. next Friday. And remember now, we can sit and watch. I don't know about you, I watched the rugby game three times over. We watch the game, then we assess the game, then we analyze the game, and then we just check how we really won. Um, you can sit in a high-impact, full-on weekend for one weekend a, a year. Because you've got the capacity. Amen? Hundred, hundred rand. And, uh, and I know there are some of you that can't make it due to business and, you know, pre-planned situations and others that, that, that said to me they can't make the Sunday, they're not here. At least come for what's there. I, I once said to somebody, somebody said to me, if you can't do it at all, if it all don't do it at all, I say, I, I just need one hour with you, one meeting with you to change your life forever. Amen? So uh, can, I, can I hear an amen from the men? Amen. Next Friday, Friday evening, Saturday, and then Sunday from after the church service, um, a few sessions. So I'm counting on you because I believe God wants to do something with us, in us, through us, and without us. Amen? Hallelujah. Okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to preach to you this morning out of Acts 4 again. Can I just say one more thing? You know those two young guys that make the announcements? They're super cool, are they not? <laughs> My goodness. I used to do that. They don't want to let me do it anymore. I said, guys, I can do it too. And then they say, no, we've got Joe. Joe sounds a bit like God. <laughs> yeah. Good morning. 
without, like, like, you know, you want to turn and say, speak, Lord, your servant is listening. <laughs> I don't call him Joe. I just call him the voice. Because when he speaks, I'm not sure whether it's God or Joe. They said, cool, man. I love it. I love it. Oh. That's why I'm still here, because I just need to keep them in case they get too confident. I love them all. They're beautiful. God wants to minister to you, but also through you. One of the greatest things that could happen to us in this time is the church becoming aware of the fact that we are the church, that God has never intended for us to leave the building, not to return, but not to be in the building without going out there and be effective and productive as Christians. For that... We need more than just information. I believe that we're in a a season or in a time where God wants to do something relational, not informational. We, We still struggle with the tree of knowledge. We still think when we gather information, it will do it for us. And we and we don't want to ignore knowledge because knowledge is powerful. Knowledge is beautiful when it's seen in the right context, when it's understood in the fear of the Lord, and we allow God to take the knowledge from our heads into our hearts and make it revelation. It changes everything about the way we approach life, and we approach the very knowledge that we carry. The problem is that, that, that we are creatures of comfort, and so what we do is we, we think that by having certain information, it'll do it for us, and, and God stirs and, 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 and shakes the, the boat a little bit so that He wants us to know that he's much more than just mere information. He's a God of revelation and experience. And so so God's calling us and he's stimulating and stirring us to to get to a place where he says, "I, I want you to be who you say you are and I want you to demonstrate that wherever you go. And so we're talking a little bit about not just having the Holy Spirit minister to us so that he can bring comfort and encouragement and motivation, but rather that he can stir us up and also minister through us because we are a people of Come, uh, courage and strength, and that, that's why we, we did that sermon last week when, when the disciples went out, and remember we spoke about from zero to hero, where Peter, that have been with the Jesus, that, that, that's what's uh, declared in Acts 4, they say, when they saw their boldness and their courage, they realized they've been with Jesus, and we determined that Peter and all the disciples were with Jesus before. And even though they walked on water and they saw signs, wonders, and miracles, and they participated in ministry with Jesus, and Peter made a few commitments about how he will never let Jesus die and how he will die before he denies him, he ends up denying him and fail in a way. And then the Peter that, that, that comes forth and comes out in Acts is a different Peter. A Peter that have been with the resurrected Christ. A Peter that have encountered this Jesus that have taken away not just spoke and preached and taught some powerful and dynamic words, but a Jesus that demonstrated that he's well able to take sin, sickness and a disease upon him and set us free. And not just that, conquered death forever. And Peter loses all his fear of death. And a man that's not fear, uh, afraid to die is not afraid to speak. A man that is not afraid to die is not afraid to stand up and proclaim and declare the very one that brought him to a place of liberty and fearlessness. Not not just does he come to terms with an understanding that this Jesus is not just one who teaches and speaks and and tries to stimulate and stir some form of movement. He is the very movement himself. He is the one who is life the way and the resurrection. He is everything, and Peter buys into it, and not just does he take that and and, and, and go to another level, but God says, and he promises in his word, Peter, I'm not gonna leave you alone. I'm gonna give you my spirit, and Peter and everybody else gets empowered. They don't just receive the spirit for them, but they receive the spirit on them, and men, ordinary men, men that the Bible tells us about, when they see the unlearned and unschooled and and they're not really equipped when they come forth with such boldness they realize they have been with Jesus changes everything everything changes for them and they begin to minister in the power of the spirit and I want to say this to you this morning your season is here church 
Your season is here not just to receive for yourself, not just to receive the comfort and the encouragement and the ministry of the Holy Spirit to you, but God is going to stimulate and stir you and cause something to rise up in you so that He can minister through you. When you leave this place on a Sunday, when you, leave, when you enter and engage at your work on a Monday, you are officially kingdom deployed. I, I, I don't really care who you work with, how godly, ungodly, what background, what faith, what, who they are and who they're not, how intimidating, kind or unkind they are. You have got somebody greater in you and something greater upon you. And God wants to give you insight and revelation how to go about it so that you can be effective, not in little religious circles, not just in connect life groups, not, not just, you know what I'm saying, but everywhere, wherever you go, be deployed knowing that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. For that to happen, we need to encounter God. We need to encounter the Spirit of God. And that's exactly what happened to Peter and all his fellow disciples. I want to read to you again out of Acts chapter 4 like I did last week and minister to you and I call it, What is in a Name? The priest and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. Now remember they'd just been to the temple where there was a guy backing, backing begging for alms. And, uh, and, and they reached out to him and said to him, silver and gold have we not, but what we have. They had something new and fresh we give to you in the name of Jesus. And they pulled him up, and something phenomenal happens, a miracle happens, and this man gets healed, and he, he's so excited, he goes jumping and leaping and praising God. And it's now a big concern to those uh, spiritual leaders, those uh, Jewish leaders of the day, and they now want to confront Peter and John because they're uncertain about something. And I want you to listen carefully because I believe something is going to shift over people, in people, and around people this morning as we share this with. So they were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection and the dead. They seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed, so the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. That's quite powerful, isn't it? It's not just a casual sharing of a testimony or a casual preaching of a sermon, trying to work people up, get them excited. They proclaimed that Jesus is the risen King, that He releases life, resurrection life, and those that believe were 5,000 men. And the next day, the rulers, the elders, and the teachers of the law met in Jerusalem and as the high priest was there, and so were Caiaphas, John Alexander, and others in the high, high priest family. And they had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them. By what power or by what name did you do this? And then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the gospel, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you cru crucified, by whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. This is the man that denied Jesus. This is the man that he didn't, said he didn't know him. He's now saying, by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, out loud, confident and bold, Jesus is the stone you boulders have rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation, now he goes further. He goes one step further. He says, salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished. And they took note that these men had been with Jesus. But since they could see that the man who had been healed standing there with them, there was nothing they could say. And so they ordered them to withdraw from the Sanhedrin and then conferred together. What are we going to do with these men, they asked. Everyone living in Jerusalem knows that they have performed a notable sign and we cannot deny it. But to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, we must warn them to speak no longer 
to anyone in this name. And then, of course, I want to talk to you a little bit later, refer to more scriptures, as they try to intimidate them and manipulate them and threaten them what happens because they got to know and understand. A name is a wonderful thing. I was thinking about it this week. I had to uh, replace my driver's license and, um, and my passport. So I went in and I thought about the, the name that on this card with my photograph and the name, how important it is that they will identify the person with the name and the name with the person. And, and I started thinking about what is in a name, you know. And, it, and the name is, of course, very precious. My name means, Louis means mighty warrior. So every time that you call me, you call forth a mighty victorious warrior. And my second name is Pietras, Peter, means the rock, near Clippy. <laughs> so you call forth purpose and destiny every time you call. My names are important. They've got personal meaning, cultural meaning, and value, family connections, historical value, and express something about your DNA. You know, I saw a, I saw a doctor once, and we started chatting, and we spoke about how people, and especially young boys, uh, use all kinds of stuff to build bigger muscles and get stronger so they can play rugby. And he told me a story about um, um, this mother that, and father that came to see him and tried to help their boy to, to grow extra strong and big muscles so that he can play rugby. And, and they said they, they, they encouraged him a little bit to, to eat right and practice hard and and go to the gym and do certain things, but they kept on coming back and tried to s see what they can do to maybe an injection or two that will just, you know, make the thing happen, you know. And the doctor sat them down after they did all the scientific tests and everything else. They said, he said to them, listen, I want to explain something to you. Uh, that, that when you play certain sports, s s some people, it doesn't matter where you come from, but, but there's something in your DNA that enables you just to run faster. And if you can't run fast, you just can't run fast. If you, 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 the, the different people have got different DNA for different purposes and different. You see, so, so you know, some people, they just like horses. They, they just can run. They just build like they can run, and they're strong, and they're fast. And others are like donkeys. You know, they do a different job, and they, but they can't run fast. And he looked at them, and he says, your son is a donkey. It doesn't matter what we inject him with. It tells you something about you, and, and it doesn't mean that you're bad. It just means you're called to do something else. And you can't try to manufacture, make something. There's something about you. Your name says something. It tells others about your influence or your lack of influence. And it sometimes causes people to give you nicknames. And, and sometimes they, they even use names to do name dropping because somehow they think you're strong and powerful or, or whatever it is that we do these things for. And sometimes it provokes people to say bad things and curse and, and mock and, and belittle people because they say, oh, that family or that thing. But, but the, a name is a powerful thing. And, and somehow in the story, this name thing comes up. And, and the disciples are talking in a name that causes the leaders, the spiritual leaders and the political leaders of the day to be concerned about because they wanted to know in whose name are you doing this thing. Now, I want to read you one or two scriptures quickly before I carry on preaching so that I can set a, a, a platform for us as to what is being said here. I want to read you three portions of scripture. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 17 to 23 I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know Him better. I pray that the eyes of your understanding may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which He has called you, the riches of His glorious inheritance in His people and His incomparable great power for us who believe. That the power 
is the same as the mighty strength that exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the right, at the right hand of, of, the, of the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in this present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be the head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything. Philippians 2.9 says this, Therefore God has exalted him to be the in the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, that every tongue would acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. In Hebrews 1, 1 to 4, it says God, God's final word from his son. In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom also he made the universe. The son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word, after he had provided purification for sin, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior, superior to theirs. Did you hear that? So somehow, these leaders of the day saw something happen. Something happened with the New Testament church. Something happened within and through the disciples that concerned the leaders of the day as to what was happening, there were such notable miracles, such radical change in the community, that one of the first questions they ask is, in whose name? Now, I want to talk to you a little bit about that, because I think somehow in all of our hearts, we sing about this name, we declare this name, and somehow we don't always experience the power and the fullness of the name that we should and all I can do this morning is trust that as I speak the Word of God, that the Spirit of God will remove certain veils and bring a greater level of insight and understanding. Because when you and I understand the power of this name, it will change our everyday living. It will change the way that we approach people in every facet of life, in family, in business, friendship circles, because we know that we've got the backing of that name. Because you see, when we read this, you need to understand something. When Jesus says, go in my name, he gave us the power of attorney. Because if the Bible tells you and me that all authority and all power is invested in his name like we just read, and it's the name that's above every other name, and then he says to us, therefore go. He says in Matthew 28, he says, Jesus came to them and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He's sending them out on his behalf, empowering them, giving them power of attorney. Power of attorney is a legal document that gives an individual, the agent, the authority to take action on behalf of someone else, the principal. So God says, I give you the right. So, so what is it that happened here? First of all, the disciples proclaim their salvation in no, no other name. They, they declare unashamedly something happened to Peter and all the others that they realize it's not just another religion. It's not just another thought pattern, a sermon, just a little course that we want to do about a movement that we're starting or something great that you can experience. It is the answer. There is salvation in no other name. They, they proclaim it. They say that in Acts chapter 12. There is salvation in no other name. And there's a reason reason why Peter and them proclaim that. Because you see, Jesus did not just inherit a name like we've heard in Hebrews chapter 1 there. He also made a name for himself. He came to demonstrate that what he preached, how he lived, how he behaved, was worthy of this name that was bestowed also upon him. So you can get a name because you inherit it. You can get a name because you make a name for yourself. You can have a name because it's bestowed upon you. And all three of that happened to Jesus. He inherited a name that was greater than any other name. 
But it was not just a great name so that people can do name dropping. It's not just a name so that people could resist it and to choose whether they like it or just religiously proclaim or declare it. It was a name that carried with it all the authority and all the power and, in a, and could release to others the same authority and power if they would just yield to it and believe it. They proclaimed salvation in this name. The first response that then came from the leaders of the day is that they opposed it. Now, I want to say something to you today. When you go out in the name of Jesus, when you begin to preach the good news, when you begin to minister to people and there's evidence of the presence of God, and I, I want to say this to you, I believe that more than ever before, the body of Christ will not just minister mere knowledge and information, but it's the season and time where they will minister revelation with a demonstration that brings about transformation. Are you listening? You, you will be the tool. You will be the instrument in God's hand where we're not just communicating. And I want to say this to you when that happens. Oh, well, let me just stop for a moment. See, we need to understand that there's nothing that you and I can do to cause God to love us more or less. God does not love you because you're lovable. God doesn't love you because you do anything right or because you do it or don't love you because you do it wrong. God loves you because God is love. And God will never stop loving you because God is a God that loves his people always and forever. He's a good God and a kind God. That's why you can't go to churches and say to other people or other places that God loves us. God loves everybody. Depending on where you are with God and what you understand is how you experience the love and how that love touch and affects your life. But God loves everybody. God's present everywhere. He says he's omnipresent. And so you can go to churches and they might do it totally different from us. And, and we might do it totally different from them. God loves everybody and God's present everywhere. He promises that he will never leave nor forsake you. Now listen to this. To experience the activity of God, you have to be yielded and obedient. So you can be in a place where people are loved by God, experience the presence of God, but there's no activity of God because there's no yieldedness and obedience. That doesn't mean that God can't move because He's sovereign, but, but you know what I'm saying. It is when you and I yield and obey that the love of God and the presence of God causes us to cert take certain action that have certain results. And that's not for special people, that's for everybody. So when there's some movement and God begins to do things and speak to you and through you and God begins to minister and you get opposed or resisted by people, don't get upset. Because in the disciples' time, they opposed them. They wanted to know in whose name. And that was legit. People want to know who are you and what are you doing and in whose name are you saying and who gave you the authority. It's important to 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 to, to uh, to receive that and facilitate that in a godly way. Because you see, when you go through the Bible and you read the people of God, the, the leaders of the day, they knew that signs and wonders could happen through anybody. Can, can you remember that? Can you remember when Moses came to Pharaoh and he threw down his rod? They threw their rods down too. They, they, they wanted to know, is what we're experiencing here demonic? Is it, is, by what name, what, what God's operating in? It's the pagans that could also do some signs and wonders. Uh, in Ephesians, it says that, in, uh, rather in 2 Thessalonians, let me, let me read it to you quickly. I want to read it to you. In 2 Thessalonians, it tells us that. Listen to what it says. The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with, with how Satan works. He will use all sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders that serve the lie. And all the ways that the wicked, wickedness deceives those that are perishing. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. So he's talking to it. He, he speaks about it in Deuteronomy. He says, you follow other gods because they do signs and they present wonders to you and they try to veer you off towards other gods. So, so, so the leaders of the day are saying, signs and wonders alone will not save the world and change the world. Truth will. The Bible says, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And that truth is not just mere 
accumulated information. That truth is based on people that had an experiential knowledge of who Jesus Christ is and a revelation of the resurrected Christ and His power, His character, and His nature. So, so they're opposing them. They said, is this demonic power? Is this demonic influence? Is this pagan gods? You, you see, they, they also knew that there were other gods. They lived in a Roman empire where there are all kinds of other gods and great names. And they wanted to know, you can't now come and tell us that there's salvation in no other name, just this name, because there are Roman gods here and there are pagan gods here. So who are you to say that our gods, you see, doesn't work and, and can't do it? And it, it was exactly the same then as it, was, as it is now. People don't want us to preach. Are you listening, church? You see, we're living in a day and a time where people say, you, you can't just say you can only get saved in the name of Jesus. And that's what Paul, Peter is saying. He says, if you want to put us in jail, and if you want us to not preach in this name, shall we rather obey him or you? Because we are fearless now. Something happened to us where we encountered the resurrected Christ in such a way that it took all fear, intimidation, manipulation. I'm not talking about shouting, screaming, intimidating and manipulating people. I'm talking about a, a excitement and a life in us that, that is forever grateful and thankful that Jesus saved us and changed our lives forever that can't stop me from speaking about the goodness and the kindness of a God that so loved the world. You see, they defended this name. The next thing that they did is Peter and them defended this name because they say there can't be salvation in any other name because there's no other name that gave himself. All other gods demand. You see, everything shifted in this little chapter uh, of, the, of the church in Acts when they changed from you have to come to God, to give to God, to perform for God, to do all the right things for the God that you serve to a God that says, I'm going to come to you and give myself to you. And when I give myself to you and you believe in me, I'm going to change your life forever. And not just will I change your life forever, I will equip and empower you and give you power of attorney to go in my name and share this with others. They defend the name. They defend the name because he's the only one that lived, taught, demonstrated, showed a character, died for what he preached for, rose again, and they all saw him, and it changed everything about what they believe. I need to be careful because as especially renewal churches, charismatic churches, call us whatever you want to, we believe in experiencing God, not just knowing God. Because God is an experiential God. He's, he's not just an information God. God wants us to know the truth, but God wants to change the truth into a reality for us. And that's why we preach for people to have encounters. And encounters is not you and me falling down and shaking. It can be that, and it's good when it's that as well, because God needs to demonstrate to us that His power is greater than us. He's, he's greater than our resistance or our ability to stand uh, when He wants to put us down. He says, he says that in Psalms 23, the Lord is my shepherd. He makes me lay down. There are times that God will make you lay down, whether you want to lay down or not. So just lay down sometimes before he makes you lay down. But, but, but God is well able to do that. But, but, but encounters is not just you and me falling over and shaking. It's not just us laughing. It, it is the encounter that shifts something in me so big that the way I speak and the way I behave and, and the way I treat others totally changed because I had an encounter with God, God's wisdom and God's knowledge and God's insight, a revelation that, that so impacts me that I, I change the way I address my children, I change the way I address my wife and the way I behave towards her. I, I, I had to go through so many changes in my life. I said to somebody the other day, been in ministry for 40 years now, you know, and, uh, and, and I, had, I have to keep on changing. Not because there's something wrong for, with me, but because there's something more for me. God loves me the way I am, but He loves me too much to leave me the way I am. And so He keeps on working on me, and, and He's adjusting me. And so, so we need to have encounters with God where, where, where somebody looks at you. Has, has somebody ever done that to you? Say, you know, I, I haven't seen you for a long time, but you've totally changed. And, and if you've still got a bit of carnality in you, you don't know how to take that. Because they, oh, you've changed. And I've learned when that change is good, then I receive it because I say, of course I've changed. It's my intention to change. My goal is to be more like him. 
and God changes. And, and things that, that was like this has now changed to how I do. That there's a, there's a great, not an arrogance or a self-confidence, but a God confidence in the way that I approach uh, and, uh, people and how we serve people and how we approach life because we're not so easily moved and offended and hurt and, and, and feel rejected and sidelined because the mission is clearer. The heart is totally surrendered to a king. We, we've encountered more of the resurrected king that makes us less offendable and, uh, and, 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 uh, and make us more confident about the goodness of this God. They're defending this name. Peter says there's nobody else that, that have so totally absorbed when we were not looking for him in Romans 5 that he came looking for us and took our sin, sickness, and disease upon him and died for us anyway so that we could have his Zoe life. For, for that you and I have to go beyond a scripture verse and a quote. We, we have to encounter this God. We, we have to surrender our hearts and trust our hearts fully and completely with Him. And so they, they couldn't deny that because they, when they looked at the situation while they debate with Peter and amongst themselves, they said this, we, we cannot deny the fact that we have experienced a notable miracle. The evidence is here. Listen, church, when we experience this living Jesus, when we experience the fullness of the Spirit of God upon us, it's not a goosebump thing. It's not so that you and I can just have a nice verse or share a nice verse with somebody. Listen, I tell you what, uh, if, if I may say this, the whole fivefold ministry in the body of Christ have been under scrutiny from apostles to prophets to pastors to teachers to evangelists to reassess and revisit what is the purpose to equip and empower the body of Christ, not just to preach nice messages, say nice things, get big crowds and prophesy something casual over somebody. Listen, when you hear the voice of the living God, it changes your life forever. It's much more than, oh, I've got a nice word for you. Come on. Uh, it's, 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 a, it's a word from God to Peter that says, come, that gets a guy out of the boat in a stormy situation and walk on the water on a word called come. And God's saying, I want to do something that when you open your mouth and you speak on my behalf, I've given you power of attorney. And when you speak on my behalf, in my name, the word of the living God, whether it's one word, a short sentence, a big prophecy, a scripture explanation, whatever it is, when you do it, it will change lives forever. Because when you speak my word in my name, they will encounter the one that sits behind the word. Not you, me. Amen. So they're defending this word, this name. And at the end of the day, they realize this is not a demonic thing. It's not just any pagan God. This is almighty God they're facing. And the only thing that they can do, because now they are, they are challenged, they are upset, they are uptight, they don't know what to do because all of a sudden everything is changing, what they call religion. All of a sudden they can't call and demand what they demand to demand in a religious context of what people need to do, how they need to give, and what they should do, because these people have now encountered a new message, a message of freedom and liberty, that you can come into Christ and be set free. You can live by Him, and He can equip and empower you. Ordinary, normal people, unequipped men and women, you can change through the power of the gospel and become carriers of the good news and, and, and have an authority that you can speak by in the name of Jesus. So all they could do is that from now on, you can't preach in that name. But it couldn't stop them. It couldn't stop them because they've been delivered from the fear of death. They've been delivered from the fear of man. They have seen the full power of the resurrection and the power of Jesus Christ. And they now are going to live fearlessly. Can I stop you for a moment and say to you that if you are still intimidated by people, by by, by men and women around you, if you are still fearful to speak the name of Jesus, share at the right time and the right place as the Spirit prompts you the good news of Jesus Christ, we need to break the fear of death, the fear of man, and the fear of intimidation off you because you are a carrier of the good news. God wants to do something not just for you. God wants to do something in you. I want to finish this morning. I want to finish this morning by saying to you that when you understand what it means to live in the power of the resurrected Christ, when you've encountered the living Christ, it changes the way you do Christianity. It changes the way we do life. It changes the way we speak to other people. When we understand that when we live 
with an encounter of that resurrected Christ, the Spirit of God comes upon us in a different way. It's not a little ministry thing, a showmanship thing. It begins to become the very power of God demonstrated to those around us and a touch and change their lives forever. It doesn't matter how long or short the encounter is. But not just that. It causes us to, change, to pray different. Because the Bible says this, and I, and I want to finish with this. It says in Acts chapter 4, verse 29. After they said to them that if we hear you speak in this name, we're going to put you in jail. They threaten them, they intimidate them, and tell them what they can and can't do. It says this, they went and came together and then they prayed. They said, now Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand and heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And they prayed. And the place that they were meeting in was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. There's something about a name. There, there's something about a name that's much more than just us casually mentioning it sure. or adding something to it that we think it's worth or not. And, and, and when these people prayed, they prayed with a new sense of vigor and faith and conviction because they'd been taught all their lives, if you were a Jew or you were an Israelite, you were taught from the beginning certain very important things. The psalmist and the authors of the books of old would tell you, when you come into the presence of God, you come with thanksgiving. Before you moan, you groan, you have a wish list, a, 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 a lot of requests, you come in by thanking God that He's good and He's kind and all the good things He's done. You always do that. I want to say this to you today. When you pray, before you say anything, thank God that you're still alive. Thank God that He's good. Thank God for all that He's already done for you. The second thing Israel would always do, they would mention God's names. Because God taught them about Himself. He's not just a God of signs and wonders. He's a God of character and nature and capacity and ability. And, and that's so, so He would teach them. He says to them, I'm Elohim, your Creator. I'm Jehovah, your Lord God. I'm El Shaddai, your supplier, one that's more than enough. I'm Adonai, your master. I'm Jehovah Jireh, your provider. It's not a song. I'm Jehovah Rapha, your healer. I'm Jehovah Nisi, the banner over you. I'm Jehovah Tzitkanu, your righteousness. I'm Jehovah Makades, your sacrifice or your sanctifier. So, so when they would pray, and, and you know what's the most amazing thing? You might know, you might not know this, but right here in Acts chapter 4, verse 29, is most probably the longest prayer recorded by people in the New Testament. And that's what they do. They, they go to God and say, Lord, I, I know that you have showed us who you are. You've anointed us and empowered us with your Holy Spirit. But, 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 but just the physical me is a bit scared again. I want to read you another scripture. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 4 and 5. Paul is out. Great Paul, the apostle is out. Paul that have, that have almost gone shipwrecked and that gone shipwrecked and have been left for dead and have gone through everything. Listen to what Paul's writing when he faces the Corinthians. It almost sounds like he's contradicting himself. He says, my message and my preaching. Verse 3, verse, uh, second, 1 Corinthians 2, 3. I came to you in weakness, with great fear and trembling. Did you hear that? Paul is saying, I came to you with weakness, great fear and trembling. But my message and my preaching were not, were not the wise and persuasive words of men, but a demonstration of God's power. So that your faith might not be in a man, but in the wisdom of God's power. And then he carries on and he says, yet I do speak a different kind of a wisdom to mature people that understand the mysteries of the kingdom. Are you listening to that? It's almost like Paul is contra... You see, we keep on getting this thing wrong. We keep on thinking, for me to flow in power, courage, and strength, I need to be strong, unshakable, immovable, and not weak at all. And Paul says, no, no, no. He says, when you're weak... 
then you're strong. It's not you that shouldn't be shaking. It's God that's not shaking. And so when you go out into a world out there and you understand and have a revelation of the name that's above every name, the name that's higher than all names, a name to which every knee will bow and every tongue confess, the one that conquered Satan, sickness, disease, principalities. And when you understand the name, you might shake, but he's not shaking. You might be uncertain, but he's not uncertain. And when you've got that revelation, you either believe it or you just casually use it religiously and then you'll end up with no activity and no movement because the love of God's here, the presence of God's here, but the confidence to obey and yield to Him to what He wants to do is absent because you're too scared, you're too scared to make a mistake. You're too scared that people might not like you. You're too scared that people might sideline you. You're too scared that you might not be famous, that they might not like your name because you have not encountered the name, and so they pray different. They say, Father, we come to you in the name that's above all names, and behold, they're threatening at work, and how people are sidelining, and what they're saying to us as Christians in town, and Jesus says, don't, don't, don't worry, even if it affects you a little bit, don't be moved by that, it doesn't move me. You will always pray when you understand the power that's in this name. You will pray, listen carefully, you will pray not to change God's will, but to pray to know and align and experience God's will. You won't pray for an easy life. You'll pray for a powerful and a powerful life so that whether things change or don't change, a powerful God will take you through it because you believe in a God that can change anything. You won't just pray how to get out of it. You will also pray God will help you to get through it. And the Bible says when they prayed in that name, the whole place shook. As they praise His name, pray His name, and believe in His name, He glorified His name. Church, listen to me this morning. I believe it's the time and the hour of the church. Stop praying, Lord, change everything around me. Change people around me. Change circumstances around me. Stop just reading good books. I want to say to you, oh, you have to hear this correctly now. Stop just reading the Bible. Please keep on reading the Bible. But do the Bible. Use what you read. Allow God not just to minister to you. Don't just gather information. Allow Him to make it revelation. And as you get the revelation of this Jesus... I believe the church is still the most powerful, the most dangerous, the most amazing, dynamic organism on the earth. When we open up and say, God, won't you just take this ordinary man? Won't you just take this ordinary person? Won't you allow me to see who you really are and not just casually use a name in a religious context, but when I mention the name, even when I shake and when I'm uncertain and even I don't know how to say and I fall over my own words, you are unshakable, immovable, unchangeable and always the same. And when I mention your name, the Bible says in the Old Testament, Dagon fell flat forward onto his face because they came into the presence of the Most High God. You are not just a casual believer. You have got power of attorney in Jesus' name. You have got the authority to address things in your own life, to say to Satan, no longer will you trap my mind. No longer will you intimidate and put bad thoughts into my heart concerning my future and who I am and what I'm called to be. I break that in Jesus' name. And when you say it, you mean it. You're not just thinking it, you believe it because somehow you've encountered the living God. That gives you the right to walk up to people. People say, I can't just go and heal people. You can go and heal people in Jesus' name. Not ask God to do it. He's done it. You go out. And when you obey, when you and I yield and know so that we can experience the will of God and step out in little ways of obedience, you and I begin to experience the miraculous, life-changing, power of the Holy Spirit working in us and working through us. 
And I want to encourage you today that God wants to do not something for you, but also something through you. Because there's salvation in no other name. There's no name greater than this name called the name of Jesus. And when you and I begin to declare, listen, long before you ask God to sort out your issues and your nonsense and the struggles and the battles that we face, just declare His name. Just say Jehovah Jireh. Just say Jehovah Shalom. Jesus, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. And as you speak the name, people say, do you think it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a one that you, oh man, it's, a, it's greater than that. It's more powerful than that. When you begin to really understand and you mention that name with conviction, something happens. Knees down. Demons flee because they believe in the name that's above every name. I want to pray for you this morning. If you don't know Jesus, I want to tell you there's salvation in no other name. There's nobody else that have given his life. And that's why we repent. We, we say, Lord, forgive me for doing my own thing, for trying to work out my own salvation. And I repent before him and I acknowledge that I was wrong and run to him and say, salvation comes through grace by faith only through Jesus Christ. And he makes me his righteousness. And so if you need some prayer today, wherever you are, there's a little button that you can press. Somebody will help you. If you're sitting here today and you don't know Jesus, then I want to give you an opportunity just for a moment. Just for a moment. The one that gave himself so that you can have eternal life is the one that's here amongst us this morning. Not just as an exciting message but as a living, resurrected King to save, forgive, save, and deliver you. And if you don't know Jesus this morning, I just want you to put your hand up. I want to pray for you this morning. I want to pray with you this morning and just help you to get to know Him this morning. Anybody, just put up your hand. We don't want to thank you, ma'am. I see your hand. I appreciate it. Thank you. Anybody else? I want to ask you to come and spend some time with somebody afterwards, if you don't mind. So, Father, I thank you this morning. Mind. So, Father, I thank you this morning for those hands that went up this morning. We pray that they'll experience the very life of a resurrected King in Jesus' precious name. I want you to stand with me, church, if you don't mind. I want you to stand with me. Now, what we're going to do this morning, we're not going to sing. We're going to pray. We're going to declare the name of Jesus. We're going to, we're going to do what the disciples did in Acts when they, when they said, Lord, behold, their threatenings. Now, I haven't got time to read it now. You can go and read it in Acts 4 where they begin to proclaim and declare. And, and, and that's what Israel always did. Listen to these other gods that says, your God's not the real God. Or, or we will wipe you out. And we will push you back and we will take your land from you then they would go to God and say you O God who is mighty and they begin to declare they, they remind God of who he is and, and, I, and I love to say it always I say and then God flexes his muscles I say let me show you what a kind father I am that I'm true to my word and true to my promises and, and that I'm a good father and I'll protect you and that's why Jesus father said he says listen up till now Jesus tell his disciples and John he says up till now you've asked me the Father, nothing in my name, but from now on I want to tell you something, because I want to take your sin, pay the price, and conquer sin, sickness, and death. From now on you ask me, whatever you ask, my Father in my name is going to give it to you. I believe God's breaking things off people this morning. You don't even have to have somebody lay hands on you. You don't even have to have somebody give you a word. And I believe in all of that. But as we pray together, mention his name, things are going to supernaturally fall off you because he's here. He's going to minister to you. As you mention his name, things are going to break off you. Things are going to change in your family. Things are going to change in your business. Things are going to change the way you do Christianity as we encounter the name that's above every name. God bless you. We love you. Remember, there's salvation in no other name. If you just hang out, or if you just hang around with me, just during our prayer time, and our morning time, and our day, and we're just.
registering, what are, what are we expecting, what are we expecting, what are we And I said, um, I'm, expecting, um, I'm expecting God to heal people, to heal, not just have healing, but become people. And I think it just ties in with what we were saying this morning about the name of Jesus. That name holds all the power. That name, the name of Jesus is beautiful. And that before we, we leave, that before we go to the, to the next song, I just want us to pray together as a family. Um, and start declaring things. It's a different story when we, um, we pray in our rooms. It's beautiful. Um, but, it's, it's but there's something that happens when we pray together as a family. And I mean, before we go, I just want us to rush in the pot and just declare things in the atmosphere. If you're needing healing this morning, whether it's anxiety or physical um, healing or whatever healing, you can heal it or whatever healing you want. So Jesus, we unveil ourselves to some people who say, come and have your way. You don't have to be quiet this morning, whether it's a whisper, whether it's a shout or declaration. Or say yes to your way, Jesus. Say, say yes to your way, Jesus. Say yes to you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, that you are who you say you are. You are what 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 you are. You are Together now, we lift our song this morning. We lift our song this morning. You don't have to keep quiet, Jesus. You don't have to keep quiet. Oh,
I just want to read a scripture over you as we leave this morning. Benji brought this to me this morning. It's so in line with what God's saying to us this morning. Isaiah 61, the spirit of the Lord God is upon you. Because the Lord has anointed you to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent you to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to those that are in captivity to open the prison doors for those that are bound. He's called you to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God and to comfort all who are mourning. To console those who mourn in Zion, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, and the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. That they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord so that He may be glorified. Church, listen this morning. You are not just saved to make it. You are saved to make a difference. That's why Paul writes in Romans 8 and he says this, what can separate us from the love of God or what can stop us from being loved by God Whatever comes our way, whatever comes against us, in all these things, we are more than conquerors. Through Christ that strengthens us. I want you just to lift for a moment your hands and just receive the strengthening of God. Not just to be encouraged, and that's good, that's part of it, to be encouraged, to be blessed to receive answers, but also to be the answer, to receive the courage, to fearlessly, by God's grace and love, face the situation and the circumstance, wherever you are on Monday, that through much wisdom and kindness, you'll make a difference for the kingdom of God. You are anointed, you are enabled, you are empowered to go in Jesus so that even at times when we are fearful or intimidated and we're shaking our God is not shaking and he will tell us what to say and what to do so that he alone will get all the glory go in Jesus name and be blessed Amen Sir, how are you? Blessed. That's good. Blessed. I was listening to your message so uh, powerfully.